Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ovidiu Mesesan. Uh, I've been helping Elma for the past 10 years with uh, high-speed designs. Um, today, we're going to look at some considerations uh, regarding uh, signal integrity uh, simulation as it impacts the design of backplanes. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time uh, going into the details. So <clears throat> most of you are probably familiar with the picture here uh, as we are uh, scaling up in uh, data rates, uh, the connectors have changed. So we're talking about standardizing um, the interfaces. Um, you know, 25, 30 years ago, uh, the density was really low, uh, maybe 30, 40 pins per square inch. Now we're looking at really high density connectors uh, and we're looking at uh, data rates that uh, are approaching uh, what most say it's uh, practically feasible over copper. Uh, 25, 28 gigabits um, per second. Now, we all have to be aware that we're designing channels. Uh, we're designing end-to-end -end channels. Uh, we're looking at the blocks that make up this channel, and we want them all to work together. First thing you, you want to consider is connectors. Uh, connectors are standardized, as uh, we uh, mentioned, but uh, they're all not the same. Um, when you get to design a channel, you have to look at your um, connector models. Your connector models are basically obtained by your connector manufacturer through um, simulation. And uh, sometimes they do compare that data with uh, experimental results. Uh, what happens is the uh, models that are extracted through simulation might have some issues like passivity and uh, causality. Now, um, it's not a fault of the connector. It's a the tools that they use, uh, basically all these 3D field solvers were created back in the day for RF and microwave, uh, not paying too much attention at the lower bandwidth. Uh, now these have to be wide bandwidth models. Um, and because the field solvers use uh, different algorithms, that, that the models that they extract might have these passivity or causality issues. Uh, the next um, building block is your footprints. This is a backplane footprint. Uh, and this is a daughter card footprint. Now, when you design the footprints, uh, you have, of course, um, your uh, pitch from your connector manufacturer, your uh, via size, but you have to give consideration to design for manufacturing. Uh, of course, you have to select your dielectric. Uh, your dielectric can uh, be any number of, there, there's so many available today on the market, um, depending on the loss. Uh, the longest link will impose basically a limit on um, how lost your dielectric can be. Um, other DFM considerations are uh, concerned with the uh, back drilling of vias. Um, how much do you want to back drill and how long of a stub you want to have left after the back drilling. This applies to both the connector uh, footprint of the back plane and the one on the daughter card. Now, again, we're looking at an end-to-end -end channel. Uh, what we want to do is simulate um, from your transmitter to your receiver. In this case, we're looking at a um, full complement of aggressors. You have um, this guy here, Alan, who's designed the switch card. Um, all these signals up here basically are on the switch card. They're being sent over um, through the backplane. And of course, this is your connector guy who provided you with the models. Hopefully, you've done your homework, checked for passivity causality, any other issues. You um, understand the implications of using that model. And um, you have designed your footprints. Now, there are other people involved in the supply chain, of course. Uh, you have Derek here, who's designed a payload card in FR408HR. You have Nancy, who's designed an Elko 4013 SI card. And you have Chris, who designed a fancy card in Tachyon 100G. This is an Isola material. It's pretty exotic. I don't know why he chose that, but you know that's his design. Maybe he wants to be able to upgrade uh, relatively easy. And of course, you've got me here, uh, my mugshot there. And I'm in the middle. I have to make the channel work through the backplane. Now, there's other design considerations. On the cards, you have your BGA vias. You have your blocking caps. Um, how do you solve this? 
you have to cascade all the S parameters that are corresponding to the um, blocks in your channel. Now, there's issues with cascading S parameters. Um, the good part is that everybody is doing it. Uh, everybody is doing it, and you know, as the commercial <laughs> went back in the day, um, it's a good thing or it's a bad thing. Well, we don't know. The um, algorithm uh, that's employed, it's basically the cascading is um, based on the scattering transfer parameters, which is the T matrix, and then it's being transformed back to the S parameters. Um, it's a mathematical construct. Now, the bad thing is, uh, as our very cool guy here, Aristotle, has said, uh, and, you know, I'm quoting, I don't know Greek, it's all Greek to me, but <laughs> the totality is not, as it were, a mere heap, but it's something that's beside the parts. So that means that when we're putting all these S parameter blocks together, we have to be aware that what the end result is, is not a mere sum of all these blocks. And the ugly thing is that the cascaded S parameters are not a physical reality to quote Heidi Barnes. Some of you might know her. She's been uh, with um, Keysight for a number of years now. Uh, back in 2008, she was with Vergy. So, as you can see, um, there are a lot of concerns when we're cascading S parameters. And if we're aware of this, then we can start solving the problems. Now, a simulation can only be as good as the assumptions behind it. Um, there's a lot of built-in assumptions, and depending on the simulator that you're using, uh, you have assumptions about um, the uh, dielectric. The dielectrics uh, is, 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 isn't a uniform and is a tropic material. As one of my colleagues said um, yesterday, um, there are issues because this is a fiber cloth, and there's glass sweeps, and then there's resin in between. Now, some models are better than others, but you have to um, talk to your manufacturer to see which one applies best. Uh, you know, you have the d model, you have the Georgia V. Sarkar model, a whole bunch of them. Uh, different simulators would employ different um, assumptions. Now, about the copper roughness, this is also an important factor because uh, skin effect loss is pretty important as you go up in frequency. Uh, again, there's assumptions being built into your simulation uh, deck. Uh, you can use any number of uh, models. There's the Hurry Snowball model. Uh, uh, <clears throat> there's a Hammerstadt model. But again, you have to go back to your manufacturer and consult with him or her on the copper surface roughness. Now, this is a snapshot of, or a cross section of a, um, very low profile, or uh, even HVLP uh, copper foil. Now you can still see the nodules here. Uh, what they do is they still have to rough up the surface to make it uh, adhere to the dielectric, to the laminate. Uh, this has impact on the um, loss at higher frequencies. And finally, you're making a whole bunch of assumptions about where you locate your ports um, when you cascade your S parameters and what type of ports you're using. Uh, you're looking at lumped or you're looking at a uh, wave port. You have to, uh, again, be aware of what the other people are doing. What you want to do is match the impedance at these ports with what the other people in the chain are doing, what Nancy, Chris, and Ellen are doing. And I'm speaking from a backplane perspective. Now, the SI um, simulation cycle, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you start with pre-layout simulations. Um, you want to ensure that um, you're giving your layout designer a good set of rules. You have to, um, of course, be aware of the design for manufacturing aspect. You're uh, doing then the post-layout simulations once you've laid out the design. Uh, you're um, verifying that what you've given to the designer is actually uh, what you're expecting at the end of the simulation. After you've built your boards and your channel, uh, you're measuring your channel. And what you want to validate that what you simulated is actually um, correct. Uh, most of the times, because of the built-in assumptions in your simulation, you will have issues um, correlating the data that you obtain from the simulations with the data you obtain from the measurement. And that's basically the last step here. 
And uh, you might have to go back and reconsider what, what um, assumptions you've done in the pre-layout simulations and go again through uh, the process of simulating um, your uh, worst case length, basically. Uh, measurements, uh, which is the last uh, part uh, before validation. Well, from a backplane perspective, you have to probe the signals. Um, now, your launches into the backplane under test have to be really good. And you can see that by looking at the return loss of, the, uh, of one of the channels. It doesn't have to be the worst case. But you will see that as you de-embed uh, your traces on your probe card, your return loss is getting uh, worse because you're getting closer to your big discontinuity here, which is um, your made it connector interface. And a good uh, fixture would show minimal loss. It will show um, a really linear uh, loss through the whole interconnect before you de-embed and after you de-embed. Uh, you can see the insertion loss deviation here um, after the embedding has been done. Uh, looks pretty good. Um, you don't have a lot of uh, up and down here. Uh, you, you have a good margin here which means um, the, the channel operates pretty smoothly down to 20 gigahertz. And it also means you validated your fixture. It's a good test vehicle. Now going back to our uh, paradigm of co-designing the channel. So here's Derek who's designed his card in FR408HR. And um, we took a look at his design. And um, basically there was a lot of insertion loss deviation happening here for whatever reason. Um, maybe um, the material that he's chosen aren't that good. Uh, maybe there's problems with launching from um, his FPGA. Um, well, all this stuff will basically go back into the backplane and cause problems at the other end, at the receiver end. So what we want to do is make the whole channel work. Instead of worrying about all these things at the very end of the design cycle, we want to put this up front and uh, again, we don't want to have a Mexican standoff with everybody. We want things to go smoothly. We improve the design both on the backplane side and on the daughter card side. Uh, you can see um, the insertion loss has become quite linear for Derek here and for the whole channel. Uh, the return loss is become significantly better, especially at the higher frequencies. And there's no standoff. Everybody's happy. On the daughter card side, we don't want to go into uh, the whole thing, but there's a lot more work than on the backplane side to optimize the structures. You have your blocking caps. You have the launch from the BGAs. You can improve all this by looking closer at your dielectric choices, um, that will impact your insertion loss, your return loss, optimizing the footprint as we talked about earlier. And um, you can also look at the antipads. Uh, now, back in the day, everybody was doing round antipads, which are clearances in your uh, reference planes. All your traces will reference uh, this black area here on a couple of layers at least, if it's a strip line design. If it's a micro strip, it will only have one reference plane, of course. And you want to optimize the footprint so that at the launch point, um, you have as uh, good as a return loss as you can. You can see this was with the round antipads, and this was with the square antipads. Now, on, on the backplane side, we already talked about this, but um, an end-to-end -end simulation uh, would basically look at uh, the performance of the channel in, in, in the context of optimizing all these parameters. Now, um, you don't want to have a case of the closed eyes. Right? We all want to have, a, at the receiving end, we want to have something that's um, really nice, open. You don't have a lot of jitter. Uh, the most contributing factor to the jitter is crosstalk. And we're going back to the connector. That's where most of the crosstalk would happen within the mated interface, also what is here in the slide here, they will always have some sort of crosstalk happening here. There is no um, differential mode of propagation 
through the vias here. They're all single-ended um, propagation modes. Speaking of modes uh, and cascading, we can go back to this slide here. Now, when you cascade things, there's an assumption here that the impedances are all normalized to your channel characteristic impedance. Now, as we all know, there's a built-in 10% tolerance on um, both the traces on your card and on your backplane. That can make for a big mismatch. So the assumption behind cascading the S-parameter reports is no longer true. Uh, you don't have a meshed impedance at your uh, cascading point. Now, when you correlate the results, you want to make sure that you're matching your setup. The setup, though, is so that from a backlink perspective, we don't always have access to the customer information. What we have access to is to what we have designed, the probe card. And we make the assumption that the daughter card is uh, pretty close to our daughter card design, which is, you know, it's an assumption, again, we're making. This is a, a nice daughter card design, but most of the times, the daughter card designers don't have the luxury of uh, selecting a very low loss material, of having the traces uh, apart, um, you know, 300 uh, mils, that's a pretty big distance. You, you can't afford to leave that kind of gap. So there will be crosstalk even before you reach the mated connector interface on the daughter card. 